Amen. Well, when was the last time you were in a pressure-packed position? When was the last time? Pressure-packed position. Stressed out, overwhelmed. For some of you parents, it was this morning, getting your three kids ready for church. Come on, somebody. You're like, man, this is every day for me. I don't know how I wrangle these kids. Pro tip, by the way, have them set their own alarm, make their bed on their own at a young age. And if they don't, have them run gassers. Find a field next to your house. Just pro tip, real quick. Uh, some of you students, maybe, maybe it's you, young, young lady, you, you're like, man, I gotta pass this exam, otherwise I don't graduate. Someone say pressure. Pressure. I, I took the real estate exam recently. I had all kinds of pressure. I failed that thing. Someone pray for me. I had pressure. My pressure got to me. Passed the national, failed the state. Pray for me. Pray for your boy. Um, some of you CEOs in this season, you're trying to steer the ship and, and leading up to this dicey season that we're going into as a country, and you're wondering how you're going to steady the ship, and you're feeling the weight of it. I mean, you, 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 you could talk about it. I, I, the, recently, just this week, I had the privilege of serving at a celebration of life for a 61-year-old man who, man, got leukemia last July and before you knew it had passed. And his wife and his son talk about, they, they felt the pressure of walking into that full of emotion, brokenhearted, but they wanted to honor God and honor their dad by sharing. And even leading up to it, I talked to the, the wife and I just said, as hard as it's gonna be, I would just invite you, even if you just wrote it down, if you can't get through it, I'll help you. But, and, and so talk about pressure packed. Have you been there? I remember specifically a season of my life where I felt maybe some of the most pressure I've had, and it was, it was a dream as a kid to make it to the NFL, and I remember going to the New York Jets, my first NFL team, going to training camp as a, as a rookie free agent scrub who had a 1% chance of making the team. Someone say pressure. And I was ninth, the ninth receiver at the end of the line. I played quarterback in college. All of a sudden, I'm a wide receiver. I'm trying to learn how to play receiver in the NFL behind some of the greatest athletes. Someone say pressure. And then about one week into it, I'm running down on a punt, and I snap my hamstring, and I'm on my back. And my dream is shattered. Talk about pressure. My, my dream is done. I'm aching physically. I'm overwhelmed emotionally. I'm not thinking right in my mind. Have you been there? In our text, when you read it, because all of y'all reading along with us, by the way, Sundays are great, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you can get to know God in your own Bible as much as you want. You wanna be strong in this season, spiritually swole, get in those scriptures because you're in a wild world right now and you and I need it like, like never before. Our Savior felt the pressure, and as we were reading, he saw it. In fact, pressure, Cam, that we, none of us have been in before. He knew what was about to happen. The, the spotless lamb, the, the sweet Savior that was gonna be wrongfully accused and then crucified to pay for your sin and my sin. He's leading up to this, this horrific event. And he knows what's coming. The wrath of God that has to deal with sin is gonna come upon him. So it wasn't just the physical pain of a crucifixion, the Roman crucifixion on the cross, but it's separation from God the Father that he had that perfect unity from before time began was gonna be separated. Why? Because a holy God can't have anything to do with sin. So he had to separate. And Jesus knew he was walking into it. And he takes his boys, takes his disciples. He's like, man, we're going to the garden, boys. We're gonna go to the garden and pray. Can y'all just be with me? He takes his three homies, Peter, James, and John, his inner circle. Can you, just, can you just come with me? Just be with me as I go and pray. And the Bible actually says he's in such 
pressure and such stress that the capillaries in his, in his like, head burst and he's sweating blood. It's a literal, it's a very rare condition. It's called like hemodetriosis or something. Y'all gotta Google that, get the, the right word. But talk about pressure, that's where he's at. Have you been there? The beauty we have, because if you came to church and you're like, man, you describe my life right now. I'm not going to be crucified, but I feel like I'm being crucified at school, at home, at the job. I, I'm overwhelmed. I got a diagnosis. I don't know what to do. I'm overwhelmed. You came to the right place. Because Jesus has a way to just show us what to do in those times. And we're gonna see how he prayed on his face to God the Father in such a pressure-packed situation. And if you're, if you're okay and you're ready to do it, you're gonna learn a little bit. Anybody wanna learn a little bit from the master on what to do when you're in that position, that precarious position where you're squeezed and you don't know how to do it? You're in financial distress right now and you're like, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my mortgage. They're gonna kick my family out of the house. Guess what? Here's the formula right here. You're gonna see it. It's, it's Mark chapter, I don't know why I get so hype. I'm so sorry. Yeah, first time guests are like, is he always like this? Like, no, man, Mike is, Mike is, not me, but Mike might be. <laughs> uh, all right, let's learn this together because I really believe that this is gonna help us if, you, if, you're, if you're willing. Zone in here, it's, it's Mark chapter 14, verse 32. Let's start there. So they, they went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. If you circle that word in your Bible, Gethsemane, it actually is a, is a Hebrew word, and it's actually gat shmanim. <laughs> Try that one, gat shmanim. And it, and it literally means the oil press. So this was a garden that they would produce these olive trees. They take the olives and they would crush it. it the, the value of the olives wasn't eating the olives. The value was inside. And you would crush the inside of that oil or of that, of that, that um, olive, and oil would be produced. And that's actually when the value came. Ooh, man, this preach is so hard. Why is that? Because that's where the value's at in the crushing. But none of us like the crushing. It's been said that humans are like sponges. You don't know what's in them until they get squeezed. But this is what's happening. Jesus, God incarnate in human flesh, is being squeezed. And it's not junk that's coming out. It's his sweet spirit of salvation that's about to hit. This is powerful. Did you know this was predicted by Isaiah the prophet in chapter 53, Verse five, check the word of God out. This is years in advance that Isaiah is talking about what's about to happen on the cross. He said, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was what? He was crushed for our iniquities. He was crushed. That's powerful. The crushing of Christ. He's on his knees. What comes out of you when you're crushed, when you're squeezed? One of, um, one of my heroes in the faith, Steve Peterson, who I thank God for, God sent him into my life in a very tough season of my life where I don't know if I'm standing on this stage without God sending that man. And he had this whole life that he would challenge me with is, hey man, like what's coming out of your life like when you get crushed? Is it Jesus? Is it Todd? Like what's happening? And this man, I saw not just talk about it, but he practiced what he preached. And I remember going to visit him. He got diagnosed with this rare disease and, and it was taking, it, just, it was changing him. And he wasn't himself in certain ways, but he was exactly himself from the inside out. He never changed. He, he always talked about it. And I remember showing up to his hospice room and he, he could barely talk. And first thing I'd walk in, he'd say, hey, Todd, you're wonderful. 
It wasn't, woe is me. I can't believe God. What are you doing, God? I've served you this many years. What are you going to do to me? He said, Todd, you're wonderful. In the crushing, in the, in, in the, in the, Worst time of his life, I saw the genuine Steve Peterson, that Jesus in his soul that was coming out. I'm like, that's the man I wanna be. That's the man I wanna be now. <laughs> it's, uh, the pressing, by the way, isn't just revealing. For many of us, it's also perfecting us. I wrote this in my notes, you can put it down. The stressing is actually a blessing. And here's why. James chapter one, he talked about it. He said, dear brothers and sisters, where are my Christians at? Y'all Christians up in here. Some of y'all non-Christians, you're on your way. I'm glad you're here. This is James talking to the brothers and sisters, my brethren. <laughs> I love what he says. And we talk about this all the time. He says, when, everybody say when. when. It's not if, when trouble. Some of us Christians need to grow a little bit. We talking about mad at God when I get a hangnail. Mad at God when you show up and you get fired at work. Where were you, God? I thought this was my dream job. We're putting it up. Hey, maybe you need to show up a little bit early and have a better attitude. Maybe that will keep you around a little bit. Whoa, that was, that was legalistic. Sorry. But <laughs> when, when troubles come your way. Consider an opportunity for great joy. Huh? I'm running from it, man. I don't want that. Consider an opportunity for great joy. Hey, joy. Great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, some of us right now, we think it's the devil, we think it's this, we think it's that. Actually, it might be God in his grace allowing us to grow. When, you know, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. Hey, let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Isn't that what we do? God, just grow me into your image. And now you're in the squeeze. You're like, get me out of it. He's like, you just asked me to grow, dog. What do you want? This is a great opportunity it, when it comes your way. When. You just nudge your neighbor, just say when, when it comes. Hey, remember what that wild preacher said. It's actually an opportunity. No, I'm just telling you what James said. Actually what God said through James. Now look how squeezed and overwhelmed Jesus was. Verse 33. Verse 33. So he took Peter, James, and John, like his inner three circles, his like three best friends, his three posse. By the way, make sure you got a posse around you at all times, because you never know when the you know what's gonna hit the fan. You need people around you that are gonna point you to Jesus, not point you to a bottle, point you to a drug, point you to another relationship. They need to point you back to Jesus. Peter, James, he grabs his homies, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul, this is the word again, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. You ever see someone crushed with grief to the point of death? I was praying about this and as I was studying, the, two, the first two, there's many that I've seen, but the first two that I thought of that came to my mind right away is when there was a tragic accident several years ago, one of our former youth pastors and best friends and his wife and a young couple, they were discipling. They were actually on their way to a marriage retreat and someone was driving on the wrong side of the road and tragically killed them. And miraculously, the, the young wife, like she, she survived. It was a miracle. And I'll never forget it was really early in the morning when we got the news and we, we got in the car, we went to South Dakota and I was with some of the family and I was just, I, I couldn't even imagine the family in their grief, but her. Can you imagine waking up in the hospital room? One day you're on your way to a marriage retreat with some of your best friends. The next moment, all three of them are gone and you, are, you don't know even if you're gonna make it, you're in critical condition. 
You talk about crushed with grief. I read another, then the other, the very next one, I don't know if you read about this, but recently in Fort Lauderdale, where we're from, on a beach, a seven and eight year old are, are, are doing the whole sand thing. They're digging a hole in the sand. And it's about a five foot hole and the seven year old girl is down there and the eight year old's kind of like on the top and, and tragically the, the sand starts caving in. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being the parents seeing that? Talk about crushed with grief, overwhelmed. There's nothing you can do. And your seven-year-old daughter, I was, I was reading an article and she said, the mom, she said, we experienced the purest human being and we are forever changed by her. Talking about the seven-year-old that passed. We love you beyond any stretch of imagination. Our sweet Sloan, what we would give. You talk about pressure, you talk about pain, you talk about stress, you talk about overwhelm, you talk about sweating blood. I can't imagine. So here's Jesus, he's, he's literally staring down the cross. What little C cross are you staring down today? What is it that's putting you in this position? Deeply distressed, overwhelmed. Uh, one of our pastor's wives recently on, on Self Fed 365, I, I actually texted her and she had been walking through the last couple of years a lot of really tough stuff and she was honest about it a little bit. And I'm like, yo, I'm gonna just have her preach because she in three minutes she took this text and tore it up. You know why she did? Because she, she's been experiencing it. It's one thing to talk about it. Yeah, all y'all just need to get, grow up with your bootstraps and just get, get, get right. She's in it. She's dealing with it. And yet, allowing the Lord to conform her into his image. She's loving people in a deeper way. She's like, man, even though I'm walking through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And she's growing in the season. That's powerful. We can either pout or, man, we can move forward in power. It's, it's up to really us on what we're gonna do in these seasons. I mentioned making sure you got your posse. Everybody say posse. When the pressure comes, you need a posse. And it's so interesting. I don't know if you, as you're reading the text, there are certain times where Jesus, remember, he's got a bunch of people following him. He's teaching a bunch of crowds are coming to watch, but then he had these 12 apostles that he was training and then sending out. But then he had these three, these three really tight dudes with him, Peter, James, and John. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be cool, by the way, to be in Jesus' like inner posse? And if you study the text, I was, I was reading, there was three different times that he took Peter, James, and John with him. Do you guys remember them? Number one, it's when uh, Jairus' daughter had died and Jesus was gonna go raise her from the dead. And he kicked everybody else out, but he's like, yo, Pete, James, and John, I want you all to come with me and see what's up. Wouldn't that be amazing to be with Jesus while he's like, hey, Jairus, watch this. My little daughter, what's he like, what's the word that you said? Arise. Oh, what's it in the Greek? Y'all know it. Talitha Kumi. Wow, my mind would be blown. Oh, how about this? Remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Did you read that one? That, that blows my mind. He, he takes Moses and Elijah. Like, Moses and Elijah just rolled back from heaven, representing the law and the prophets, and Jesus is like, let me go bring my boys up on the mountain. <laughs> what? Can you imagine being in? Like, I'm just picturing, like, Mo talking about, yeah, man, God gave me the law. You know, Elijah, yeah, we were preaching about this. And Jesus was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He lived it right there. Peter, James, and John, like, oh, got his back. And here, his most pressure-packed part of his human side on this planet, he gets the posse. He brings them. I'll just say this. You need a posse in this season. I saw this come to play in a very practical way after the tornadoes. And we challenge everybody in the church almost every week. You need a group, get in a small group, four to 14, 
The church is gonna grow big. It's gonna continue to expand. Why? Because we're trying to help as many people as we can and we're not apologetic about it. It's up to you to take the initiative to get around a group of people and dedicate yourself. I don't have time. You have time. You got time to watch Sports Center. You got time for a small group. Cut a little bit of sleep and get in a group. And then something chaotic happens in your life and you're trying to call the church. And I'm saying, call your small group people, man. I, wanna, I, I wish I could hang with all of y'all, but I can't. And our pastoral team can't. Oh, they didn't call me back. Did you, did you talk to your small group? I'm not in one. That's on you. Get in a group. This group, that sounded legalistic too. I'm so sorry. Pray for your pastor real quick. I'm just trying to get real. I, the inner coach in me comes out sometimes. So I don't wanna preach out of, okay. But this is real. And this couple who's in a group after the, the woman in the bathtub and the house got blown out, you know who was at their house the next day cleaning up and praying for them? Their group. You need a group. The storms in life are gonna be there. That's just how it is. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trial, but fear not, I've overcome it. But the, one of the ways he overcomes it is he sends a posse and he challenges you to get in a posse. I thank God for my Friday group. My little round table of homies, bringing it real. Thank you guys for always getting my back. I find myself in pressure packed situations. All of us do, don't we? Man, doesn't it feel great after walking out on a Friday morning and go, you know what, man? These guys got my back. The Lord's got my back, yeah. But these dudes, I could call any one of them and in one second, they'll drop whatever they're doing and they got my back. What you need, Todd? They got my back. There's something powerful about that. Okay. Golly, we haven't even gotten to our points. All right. You ready to write some notes? Here we go. How did he pray? Number one, this, listen, this is a great paradigm to pray. Here it is. Ready? Number one, if possible, let it pass. If possible, let it pass. I always used to be like, no, nah, man, embrace uncomfortable. Like, yeah, give me more crap. Like, yeah, sometimes it's okay. If, if it's possible, can you, just, the, can you just miraculously heal me? If it's possible in your game plan, can you send the check at the right time? If it's possible, can you do this? It's miraculous. If it's possible, can you do it? There's nothing wrong to pray that. And Jesus is gonna start with that. Look at verse 35. So he goes a little further in the garden. He falls to the ground. And listen, he prayed, underline that. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. You ever just fall to the ground in complete exhaustion, overwhelmed, crying out to God for mercy. It's where he's at. Sometimes it's the best place to be. God, if it's possible, would you let it pass? I mentioned that I had the honor and privilege of serving at a celebration of life. It's my third one in like three weeks. And 61-year-old man had everything a man could ever want. And he had been tuning in online during his illness. He couldn't make it. By the way, all of our online family, thank you so much for tuning in. You're not like second class citizens. You are very much part of this family. And this man couldn't make it. Now, if you're lazy or oh, I'm gonna get wet, like come, all right? Like, some, but, but listen, there's some people you can't make it. And, and this, this man would like see the five minute countdown. He'd be like, dude, I gotta get my coffee. But, you know, church is about to start. I had no idea he was tuning in. I get this call on a Saturday. I was supposed to be out of town. Somehow I'm in town. I go show up at this hospital. I'm with this man for two hours. Never met him. We had like this instant bromance, man, and we, and we hung out. And dude, it was, it was heart-wrenching, but also heartwarming at the same time. It was very hard to describe, but the Spirit of God was in that room, and we were having a great discussion. And what was our first prayer that we said, God, this leukemia is nothing to you. You could snap your fingers and you could heal it in one second. Absolutely, we believe that. So that's what we, we, we just prayed that first. If possible, 
let it pass. There's nothing wrong to, there's nothing wrong to, to pray it that way. The tricky thing, and we'll get into it here, some people try to like become God and name it and claim it and tell God what he's gonna do with the illness. Ah, it's a tension, isn't it? You wanna walk by faith, cast out demons, I love it. You wanna pray for miraculous healing, let's do it. But ultimately, and we're gonna get to it, it's his will. But we started there. And he looked at me and he just said, man, I'm really getting this. He, he grew up and it was all religion, religion, religion. He's like, man, just over the last year, I figured out it's actually relationship. He's like, man, I wanna lean into this more, but man, I, I might just have a few days, pastor. So we leaned in. God, you can do whatever you want. Now on the theological side, as Jesus is praying, he said, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. Let this moment pass, if there's any other way. But let's just zone in real quick. If you, if you checked out, get back in, because this is deeply important. Is there any other way for God to save humanity than the cross? He's, Jesus is basically saying, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna go do this, but is there any other way? All the world religions, a lot of them are like, if you just do a lot of good things, you'll eventually get to heaven. If you say this prayer, if you act this way, you'll, you know, you're, kind of, you're better than your neighbor, you're kind of good, you'll eventually float to heaven. If that was the case, Jesus wouldn't have to go die. It's the one unique thing about, unique thing about Christianity. Jesus was the only one qualified to bridge the gap between a holy God, a perfect creator, and sinful man. Jesus is saying, I don't wanna go to the cross. If there's any other way, can you do it any other way? Can you just like, Maybe open up the sky and be like, oh, you crazy sinners, uh, you're all good. The Bible says, though, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So there had to be the perfect lamb of God. The blood had to be shed. He's like, man, if, if I could do anything else, can you let this cup pass? The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, there's one God, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Acts 4, 12, nor is there salvation in any other. There's no other name given among men under heaven by which, what? We must be saved. One name, one way. And I know that sounds narrow. I know that does. But I would rather just look at it a little bit different. I think it's clear In a confusing world where all the gurus on the internet are telling you, oh, do a bunch of stuff. I love that just God said, hey, I, I just wanna be clear as a good dad. I'm gonna give you clarity. You wanna get to heaven? There's one way. His name is Jesus. He's the only one that's been able to do it. That's powerful. That, that just, that in my soul. Ah, oh, it's so good in my soul. It settles me. Thank you, God. I'm a stinky sinner, and yet, because of your sacrifice, I'm saved. I don't have to earn my way to heaven. I know where I'm going. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made, he, oh, this is good. For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's good news. Someone say good news. Real good, real good. Number two, jot it down, your will, not mine. And this is really hard for control freaks. <laughs> uh, God, whatever you wanna do, except that. I'm gonna do that part. So he says, if it's possible, let it pass. But right after, and that's why... We're freaks about the holistic view of the scriptures. We're not just gonna forget about certain parts. We look through the entire lens of scripture, have a balanced approach. Yes, we can pray in faith. Yes, we can command devils out. And yes, we can just believe by faith. But we also read the Bible and see what Jesus' prayer in his most pressure-packed position was. And look at the very next verse, verse 36. Abba, Father, Jericho did a great job with this. The character of God, Abba, it's daddy. God, I know you're for me. You love me unconditionally. I know who I am because I know whose I am. Powerful, Abba, Father, he cried out. Everything is possible for you. You're God. 
You spoke the world into existence. Anything's possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. And here it is. And people get mad at me for praying this, but I'm just gonna try to pray for it. When you come to me and you ask for prayer in a, in a real tough position, I pray according, and people get mad at me saying I don't have enough faith. I'm like, I'm just praying how Jesus did. He says, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Everybody say your will. Not mine. Let's say it again. That wasn't real convincing, man. Let's go. Everybody say your will. Not mine. Boy, that's different. That's different than the modern day Christian naming, claiming like, my will. See, here's the, here's the crazy thing about it. And I know it's right hearted, but all of a sudden I become God. He said, no, you're Todd. I'm God. Why is that so powerful? God is sovereign. He's in control. He's got the skybox suite to your entire life. You're in the parade marching. You don't see from his perspective. He knows the pain you're going through and the chaos that we're walking through right now is forming you into something that no one else could. And we go, God, this sucks. Can you take it away? Sorry, I just cussed it. Not really. Ah! And he's, what is he saying? He's saying, no, man. He says, can you do this? But nevertheless, your will be done. What is that? Listen, write it down. This is, this is what Pastor Steve taught me. Ultimately, I'm gonna surrender and submit to your sovereignty. This is where Western Christianity really suffers, and I'm the chief of sinners. Can I truly say, God, I'm submitting to your sovereignty. I hate this. Can you take it away? Nevertheless, your will be done. I ultimately place my trust in you and you alone. Some of my good friends in ministry, I'm thinking of them in particular, I think it was right around the Christmas time. One of his daughters had an asthma attack and died in his arms. Can you imagine? One of the most young, successful, powerful preachers I know with his young daughter in his arms. Can you raise her from the dead? Nevertheless, your will be done. Painful, personal, can I tell you, as God wrote a book through that man, how many people were saved and going to heaven as a result of his little daughter, Lenya, going to heaven way too early? God's economy is different than my economy. My economy is make my bills work, make my house right, make sure my kids are healthy. God's economy is I'm trying to save as many souls as I can for all eternity. And somehow there's a, there's a, there's a crossroads in it and, there, and there's a tension between that that I can't figure out in my pea brain. And it's easy for me to say, but it's not my daughter in the sand. Submit to the sovereignty of God. When I was in the hospital with my friend Kurt, we prayed, number one, you can kill this leukemia, no problem. But if you don't, God, we're still gonna praise you. You can heal Kurt on this side of heaven or you can choose to heal him on the other side, trusting that you might do a work in his family and friends that you wouldn't be able to if everything was still groovy and we're out on the boat with cocktails, hanging out, having a good time. It could be that in the grave, that's actually when the family and friends and the people around them wake up for all eternity and come to Christ. That's like one person golf clapping because you understand the reality of sometimes that's what happens with us humans. It's not until the deepest pain till we finally wake up. And there's a sacrifice that happens and it's not for everybody and it's not easy. I'll just, I'll just speak very personally. I tried to document all of them. I, one of the things that God did through pain and pressure in my life is actually kill my pride. And he continues to do it. I thought, I thought by now, 
I've walked through enough injuries that I would, dude, I am the most pride. Anybody, pride just gets you all the time. The minute something good happens in your life, you're like, hey, check me out, man. Like, what's that? Like, no, dude, like, God, God did that through, like, ah. And I was just writing them down. <laughs> Ankle injuries, concussions. You know, sometimes when I'm preaching, then I'm like, what did I just say? Just give me grace, okay? That's the concussions. My freshman year, I got knocked out by this kid from Colorado. He flew sideways into the side of my helmet. I'm on the ground, eh, doing one of these numbers. I didn't even snap out of it till from Ames to Blair to the hospital, I finally understood that I was Todd Doxson. True story. Full body cramp. Before my junior year at Iowa State, I, pulled, I rolled my ankle. They gave me a shot of Toradol before every game my junior year. Pulled hamstring at New York, I told you about that. Pulled hamstring in New England. Tore my MCL in Amsterdam. Liz Frank sprain in Amsterdam, the, the list goes on. What am I trying to say? What was God doing through those opportunities? Pride, humility. Self-made man, God-dependent man. Power in God, excuse me, power in Todd. <laughs> The power in God. <laughs> oh, man, there's so much to this, and I gotta land the plane in two minutes. Okay, let me just tell you just real quick, and maybe this will be a homework for you. Go read about Paul, the apostle, one of the most powerful pastors, church planners, prophets. There was a portion of scripture, he ended up coming down with an eye problem. Many scholars believe it was malaria fever, and he got this illness. And here's Paul, the same dude that people would have his hankies touch them and they'd be healed. And yet God chose not to heal the man. He cried out. He said, God, can you please heal me? Please. It's, the Bible says that he pleaded three times for it to happen. And God responded. He actually said, you know, no. So I'm just not gonna do it. See, Paul had seen things that we had. He, the Bible says he was caught up to the third heaven and he saw things that were so brilliant, like you can't even repeat. That to me would be a temptation to be prideful. I've been hanging out with God and stuff, you <laughs> second class Christians. <laughs> the Bible says so he wouldn't get too puffed up with pride. He let that thorn in his flesh keep him dependent on God. Maybe that's what's happening in your life my life. All right, I'm just gonna skip down to number three. Just jot it down. As we pray, be persistent and passionate. Persistent and passionate. I don't know if I really caught this really ever, and I've read this text so many times in the past. Verse 39, Mark 14, 39. So it says, then Jesus left them again did you catch this? And he prayed the same prayer as before. Okay. That, so, how do I say this? There's some people in the faith movement, name it and claim it, they actually will say, pray one time and believe it. If you pray again, you really don't have faith. Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayer as before. I don't think Jesus had lack of faith. But there's something about praying persistently. The Bible says, pray without ceasing and passionately. I was kind of comparing the accounts of this in the scriptures and wouldn't you know, in Matthew, or excuse me, in Luke chapter 22, the account of this same thing, verse 44, I just wanted to show it to you. He prayed more fervently, passionately. And this was the, this was the third time he, he was praying this. And he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. It was during this, this third prayer that he's actually praying again and he's sweating drops of blood. passionately, persistently. That's how we pray. I'll close with this. 
because I, here's what I wanna, here's what I wanna say. There are conditions, there are relationships, there are circumstances that you've been praying for for a very long time and you're just about to tap. You're about to quit praying. And let me just give you a story to help you understand. Pray like Jesus passionately and persistently, but I'll give you a real life situation. One of my good friends who's in my group on Fridays, who we prayed for, <laughs> I tell him this often, I used to drive by uh, his, his place and I don't know how many times I prayed for the guy. And there were times where I'm like, this knucklehead, he's so hard, he's never gonna get it. And his wife tells a story about how she almost got, she, in fact, she was almost there. She'd been praying for him for many, 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 many moons, many years, many moons. And she was humble enough and honest enough to go, I just lost heart. And she said, right when I was about to give up, I just leaned in a little more. <laughs> that man came up right here. I can still see it with tears in his eyes. A couple of years ago, he said, man, I'm done trying to put my trust and faith in all the things that are tangible, all the things I'm trying to control and manage and micromanage and anger and bitterness of my past. And I'm just gonna release it to the Lord and see what he might wanna do. <laughs> and can I tell you, one of my greatest joys of coming to the, you know, the round table. Yeah, man, Jesus got me this week, man. I'm telling you, I had so much prayer, but Jesus is good. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's how I felt this week. I was about to tap, and then you walked into the room. It was the same dude that we were praying for for that many years. So don't give up, amen? Okay, Lord, thanks for this word. It is such a good word, and it's timely for us that are feeling the pressure really from all sides, nothing compared to you, Jesus, but we thank you for your paradigm of prayer. Just so grateful that your text, like what Pastor Mike's been talking about, that as we're in the word and now we're in these different scenarios, we already have your word in us to remind us in our weak moments to continue to pray persistently, passionately, trusting for you to do what only you can do. Many cases, we see miracles of healing and breakthrough, financial miracles, and we believe you for that. But ultimately, we just say, not our will, your will. I don't have the heavenly perspective that you do. I don't have the holistic view that you do. You got it. And we humble ourselves again today saying, not my will, your will be done. Even in the crucible of pain and pressure, we invite you, grow us, grow us more into your image in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I wanna conclude maybe an opportunity for you to respond to this message and I don't know what you need, God does. If you're walking through just a season of pressure, can I just see your hand real quick? I felt it, I felt it actually in several areas. Thanks for being honest, you can put your hands down. We just pray for you, God, we, we do, we, we just trust you. Trust you to do what only you can do. Meet your people. Would you mature us in this season? Would you be gracious and merciful? I pray for financial breakthrough, I pray for physical breakthrough. I'm praying specifically for some rhythms and disciplines in, in some of our lives that we've never had before, physically, mentally, strategic, strategic fast from social media, from certain things we're consuming that are leading to destruction. We just pray for wisdom, power. Would you do it?